From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. With Anne-Marie Hordern in New York City, I'm Joe Matthew. It's the calm before the storm. President Trump arrives in New York ahead of tomorrow's arraignment. A huge security presence awaiting Trump. And New York City Mayor Eric Adams has a warning for protesters. New York City is our home, not a playground for your misplaced anger. We'll have insight from our political panel and legal analyst, Rebecca Royfe. And we'll focus on the surprise announcement from OPEC, cutting oil production by a million barrels a day, what it means for prices and for the Biden administration. Also, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy makes it official on his meeting with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen. That meeting now set for Wednesday in California. Joe, happy Monday to you. What a 24 hours it's been. It's only Monday. It feels like a week. And what I can say from Manhattan is that it is gridlock in Midtown. Yeah, you're at the center of the storm there. And, and what a turn here in classic Donald Trump to show up a day early and try to squeeze as much showbiz out of this as he can. Although, Anne-Marie, you can tell us you walk by Trump Tower, still more reporters than protesters from what we hear. That is exactly right. So on the west side of the street, it is a long lane of protesters, uh, excuse me, reporters, camera crews, lenses everywhere you look. It was very confusing, Joe, I have to say, for some of the tourists that just wanted to see Fifth Avenue. Then the other side, there were Trump supporters, but definitely the journalists outnumbered them. I'll be, be deeply curious to see what happens around inside and around the tower tonight and around the table with us here Bloomberg's deputy managing editor, Wendy Benjaminson, to kick things off along with national security reporter Dan Flatley. It's great to see both of you with us here. Wendy, this is classic Trump. Try to get ahead of the story. Try to squeeze as much showbiz out of it as he can. Is it going to actually help him? Yes. I mean, say what you will about Donald Trump. The guy knows how to market himself. It's a lot of free airtime. There's a lot of free airtime. And as you saw, if anyone had their cable news on all day, a lot of the cable news stations were running the plane taxiing on the runway and the cars driving from LaGuardia into the city. It was like the OJ thing all over again. Everyone was glued to their TVs. What's going to happen? And all that happened was he went from the airport to his <laughs> apartment to await the arraignment tomorrow, as we're seeing there. Yeah. So, yes, it is. But he is squeezing yet another day of dominating the headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, Wendy, not only is he dominating the headlines, he's dominating the campaign funds. Today, I saw that they've passed, the Trump campaign, $7 million. How long does this continue, that he's able to bring in this level of money? Well, that's just it, Emory. As long as he's in the headlines, he is going to be raising money. And you know, they say they raised $7 million. We won't actually know for sure until the campaign finance filings come out April 15th, I believe, is the deadline for the first quarter, and we'll be able to see. But because this started in late March, the, he, the, he started the fundraising, you know, ramping it up a lot before March 30th, so that first quarter uh, campaign finance report will, will be juiced up. You can see this uh, tweet from Jason Miller. In only three days since the news of the indictment, President Trump's campaign has raised a record $7 million. He's not the only one. Speaker McCarthy is raising money on this, too, isn't he? Speaker McCarthy is raising money on this. Senator Josh Hawley sent out a fundraising appeal. Mm. Help me stand with President Donald Trump. Send me money today. You know, it's this, it's, it's a bit opportunistic, but that is not unique to Republicans. Mm -hmm. Let me just put it that way. There's uh, politicians raised, like to find opportunities to raise money. And, you know, the leader of the Republican Party, Donald Trump, being indicted is a great fundraising opportunity. I want to bring Dan to this conversation because Joe just mentioned Speaker McCarthy, and we have an official announcement that he will be meeting with the Taiwanese president. Dan, the White House has really gone to a pains, really, to say that the, that the Taiwanese president is just transiting in and out of the United States. Well, a meeting with the Speaker of the House is certainly not transiting. How are they going to manage this with <laughs> Beijing? Well, I think you saw a little bit of that uh, stage management, uh, so to speak, happening today with some statements from the president of Taiwan uh, and the White House sort of talking about the right of the president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, to meet 
with whoever she chooses to meet with here in the U.S., a free country, uh, Democratic allies, uh, also in South America where she's traveling. But it's going to be very interesting to see how Speaker McCarthy plays this. And not only Speaker McCarthy, but we know that Representative Mike Gallagher, who's the chairman of this new uh, committee on competition with China, will be meeting with, with President Tsai in California. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the Republicans play this and also the Democrats. But it really underscores how tensions between the U.S. and China have become sort of a bipartisan uh, project at this point. And so we, we'll be keeping a close eye on all of that. Yeah, and Beijing promised consequences if this meeting were to take place. Now that we know it's not, not just, a, to Anne-Marie's point, some, you know, bumping into each other, uh, they're actually going to be sitting out of the Reagan Library, as it turns out. What's the response going to be? Well, it'll be very interesting to watch to see what happens, because as, as you remember, when Speaker Pelosi, when she was Speaker at the time, yeah. visited Taiwan, there was a very strong response from China. That's for sure. I'm not sure that we're expecting you know, that level of a response. The meeting was moved to California, uh, or at least scheduled in this way, in order to avoid the appearance of a U.S. speaker going again to mm -hmm. the island of Taiwan. So I think that they're trying to moderate this relationship a little bit, but I'm sure we can see uh, expect a response from China. Well, we've already heard that China says they will take, quote, resolute measures to safeguard its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Will we see anything like we saw when Speaker Pelosi made the trip to Taipei in terms of military, military drills in the strait or sanctions, anything at all? Because it is still a meeting with an incredibly high level U.S. lawmaker. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think China has a whole menu of options that they can go to here. Certainly when Speaker Pelosi, when she was in office, went to Taiwan, we saw a military response. We saw missile, uh, missiles excuse me, uh, landing in the Sea of Japan. We saw uh, some militarization. We've also seen in recent days China showing a willingness to hit back at the U.S. in the same way that the U.S. has struck at its technological support. Uh, not superiority, to, so to speak, but its technological prowess with uh, chip export controls. China has announced that it's looking at Micron Technologies, which is an Idaho-based firm. So I think that we can expect to see not only a military response, but also some response on the economic and sort of technological front. So that may be actually something that has a bigger impact over the long term than, than, a, than a militaristic response. The other major story that's been making waves here in the capital today brings us back to the weekend, actually, this surprise uh, production cut from OPEC, a million barrels last month. We spoke with Amos Hochstein, Special Presidential Coordinator for Global Infrastructure and Energy Security, about President Biden's plan to refill the SPR. Here's what he said. We are still committed, the President's committed, as he said, to replenishing the SPR after the extraordinary draws last year. Uh, we remain that, that commitment uh, stays intact. We want to be in a position of replenishing, but we'll do it in the most responsible way possible. Wendy, I know you're not an oil analyst, but, but from a political standpoint, did the White House miss an opportunity here to not at least indicate that it was going to start refilling the SPR? They're talking about $4 a gallon gasoline again this summer now. The timing for this just couldn't be worse for President Biden. He's trying to announce his reelection at some point soon. Mm -hmm. um, they were hoping for April, but Trump is dominating the headlines, as we discussed earlier. Now gas prices are going to go up right as the summer driving season starts. That's yeah. not a great time to announce as we, and you know because of the fundraising possibilities right then. So it's, it's a very, very difficult time for this to be happening for the president. And yes, the question is, you know, where is he? Why isn't he talking more about this? He had his national security spokesman talk to reporters off camera today mm -hmm. saying you know, that they did get a heads up, but it's not a great idea. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen called it unconstructive in some remarks she was making today. But there hasn't been a president of the United States standing at the podium and saying, you know, what's going on here? And, and, and we're, don't worry, we're going to fill the reserves. It just leaves voters wondering. Yeah, very different response than we've seen from this administration in the past. Dan, do you think that given what we've seen now from Riyadh really leading the charge in this OPEC plus cut, that the idea of this NOPEC bill where you can basically sue one of these countries will start to come up for air in Congress? I know it was hiding dormant for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of a perennial issue. It's, it's definitely one of the tools that uh, Congress can reach for. There's also the question of arms sales and other uh, sorts of uh, support to Saudi Arabia. But I think more broadly what you're seeing, and I was listening to some folks at Goldman Sachs talk about this a little bit this morning, about how, you know, we're 
entering a world where each country are, is trying to use what they have in order to uh, be, make their presence felt on the world stage. So Saudi Arabia has energy, Russia has energy, China has supply chains and technology, the U.S. has the dollar. So we're really entering this sort of multipolar world where folks are going to be really looking to leverage what they have, the resources, in order to affect some geopolitical change in, in, in the way that they want to see the world going. So I think this sort of signals another step in that direction, certainly from Saudi Arabia. All right, certainly does. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson and Dan Flatley joining us this Monday around the table. Come up, we're going to continue that conversation on the fallout from OPEC Plus's surprise production cuts with Clay Siegel, Rapidan Energy Group Director of Global Oil Service. He's joining us from Houston. This is Balance of Power. Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Joe, it was a Sunday surprise from the Middle East, really from Saudi Arabia. For the mm. Biden administration, it had to be Sunday scaries. And you end the day with WTI north of $80 a barrel. You mentioned Amos Hochstein yeah. earlier. When we spoke to him, prices were hovering around $70 a barrel. Ten bucks. That is going to be politically challenging. And, of course, they were in the 60s just before that interview, right, following the, the bank failures and a lot of people are asking, well, why didn't you refill the SPR then? And as he told us, Anne Marie, it's just not as simple as that. The bidding process is an extended one. I just wonder if they're going to get a window like that again in the near term. Yeah, that's a great question. It's hard to get a window now when we're going to have prices in the 80s. And on top of that, mm -hmm. you have the Secretary of Energy talking about that it's going to take years to refill the SPR. We're going to dig more into this now with Clay Siegel, Rapidan Energy Group Director of Global Oil Service. Clay, thank you so much for joining us. You're coming straight from Houston. Can you give us a sense of where prices you think are going to go from here? And I ask that because it's going to be politically difficult this summer, peak driving season for Americans, at the same time that the current president, Biden, will likely be coming out announcing his bid for 2024. Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. We were already expecting at Rapidan for oil prices to firm up in the second half of this year because we were looking at a supply-demand situation that would be tightening, even before this latest news was announced over the weekend. Uh, now there's the potential for much more tightening. And I think we're going to look back on this weekend and this decision from OPEC Plus as one of two things. It's either going to be seen as a precautionary master stroke by the organization of preempting kind of a market uh, downturn, or it's going to be seen as an unintentional over tightening and send oil deficits and even prices higher than even that producer group would have wanted. So, and what's really interesting about this inflection point is it all comes down to the fate of oil demand in 2023. I know all the news yesterday and today is about the supply side, but really the elephant in the room is whether oil demand is going to continue growing at a healthy pace this year. We think about a million and a half barrels per day. And the other agencies and analysts also think oil demand is going to be healthy. If that's the case, this move could over tighten the market. But if OPEC Plus is right in kind of trying to preempt and, uh, and prevent an oil price uh, kind of meltdown, that we're going to look back and see that this was what was needed at the right time. I was struck by the administration's response today, Clay. Some were struck by the lack of response. It was, there was an off-camera series of comments from John Kirby, who speaks for the National Security Council. Now, remember the last cut in October. Uh, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, came out full force. They were very upset. They called it misguided. Today, uh, it wasn't advisable, he said, and, and quote, I'd say we're focused on moving ahead here on prices for American consumers, not barrels. But barrels, Clay, have prices. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking at the potential for $4 a gallon this summer, that's pretty hard to ignore, isn't it? No, John, you're right. It's a difficult predicament in Washington Obviously, this news is going to be unwelcome among many stakeholders in town, starting with the Biden administration. And they're in a difficult spot. You talked about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve earlier, and it is in need of refilling. But they are mandated by Congress to finish up the sale program. So there's 26 million barrels that will be withdrawn from the SPR during 
the second quarter. And then there's just a combination of mostly operational considerations, because those uh, facilities can really only flow oil effectively one way at a time. There's also uh, one and soon to be two facilities that are going to be a little bit down for maintenance, long planned maintenance. And so those two things together limit the administrations and the Department of Energy's ability to just refill in a big way opportunistically. Well, Granholm said this year will be difficult for us to take advantage of this low price. Did that send the wrong signal to Riyadh? I'm not sure if it was a question of signaling. I think that that conveyed the reality of, again, the operational and, and scheduling issues with the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. With regard to how they conduct their diplomacy, it seems after that last episode you referenced October, I believe that um, President Biden at the time said that Saudi Arabia would face uh, sort of un, undescribed undescribed consequences uh, for the cut at that time. And then, and then it seemed like both sides tried to a little bit paper over, smooth over the differences, and maybe handle things uh, a little bit more on, on the down low, diplomatically. And I think that that is the track that they prefer in this case as well. Clay, it's Joe. I, I wonder when you look at the economic forecasts for this year, the potential for a recession, at least some lowering of demand here, how that will actually uh, rationalize itself with the lower supply. Does that speak at all to the administration's more casual posture this time? And, and that's the key, is this, this big uh, cloud of macroeconomic driven concerns for the future of oil demand and GDP growth generally. And we're keeping a close eye on that at Rapidan. We still, as our base case, have pretty healthy oil demand growth year on year in 23, million and a half barrels per day. And even OPEC has, uh, has as robust an outlook as we do. But those might be prone to revision if we don't start to see uh, tangible signs that demand is going to be there uh, through 2023. A lot is hanging on the fate of the reopening uh, in China and a rebound in transportation and mobility uses of oil, uh, as well in some other regions around the world. But really the concern about uh, macroeconomic risk, are we going to have a soft landing in the major economies of the United States and Europe that will deliver that one and a half million barrels a day of demand? And if not, uh, I think the OPEC plus cut move in retrospect will look like uh, a, a smart positioning for what they knew at the time. Mm. If it turns out that oil demand stays robust and they also cut supply, then we can start looking at triple digit oil prices again and US gasoline average prices moving back above $4. If that's the case, then all of those policy interventions from Washington that we talked about in the spring and summer of 2022 will be back on the table this year, we believe. So $4 gasoline back on the table is what? Tapping the SPR again, potentially? the NOPEC bill circulating in Congress? Is that what you expect to see? Uh, those are among two of them. There's also the possibility of uh, kind of rekindling the debate over whether uh, refined product exports from the United States should be curtailed, limited, in order to try to lower gasoline prices in certain parts of the country, particularly the East Coast, or maybe considering, and this is kind of a European idea, to require US oil companies particularly refiners, to maintain minimum levels of gasoline and diesel inventories. That's another idea that could come back onto the drawing board, back onto the front burner, if we get these big deficits and high oil prices. Something tells me we'll be looking back at this conversation in a couple of months. With us from Houston, Clay Siegel, Rapid and Energy. Clay, thank you so much for being with us on Bloomberg. Coming up, we're going to look ahead uh, further into the fallout from OPEC's surprise production cut. Great, obviously. They broke the glass. And if they didn't push the panic button, they pushed the precaution button. Prices are going to rise. It's going to, it's going to destroy demand. Surging oil prices and what it all means for the Fed. Yes, that's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. This was a surprise, the OPEC decision, but whether it will have a lasting impact, I think, is an open question. Oil prices fluctuate around. It's hard to, it's hard to track exactly. Some of that might feed into inflation and make our job a little bit more difficult.
St. Louis Fed President James Bullard reacting to OPEC surprise output cuts. We were just discussing, speaking earlier today in an exclusive interview with our own Michael McKee. Joining us now here in Washington with more on this, Anna Wong, Bloomberg Economics Chief U.S. Economist. It's great to have you with us, Anna. Thank you for coming in. You're crunching some pretty scary numbers uh, at Bloomberg Intelligence today. The headline, OPEC cuts may mean more Fed hikes and a deeper recession. What are you learning? Well, I, I think that um, right now we still don't know where the uh, oil price would go in the rest of the year. But if if oil price does rise and permanently stay at about $20 mm -hmm. higher than where we are right now, I think there's a risk that the Fed may not be able to look through uh, this price shock. Um, but but there's some differences from last year. Last year, recall that the Fed had to hike 75 basis point when oil price goes to $114 per barrel. But at this time, um, at least we have seen some progress in the short term inflation expectations. It has fallen from you know a peak of 5.4 last year to now it's 3.6 percent. So there is some room for the Fed to look through it. So it's I, I, so we don't expect a 75 basis point jumbo hike to come back. But at the same time, I think that uh, inflation uh, is still a threat. So the Fed will have to stay vigilant. And I remember that in the summer when our very own Michael McKee asked Jay Powell, how are you going to tame this inflation if you don't look at care as much about energy prices? You don't chase them. Do you now have to chase them? Isn't this potentially... The second part of that, if they have to go after rising energy prices ahead of the summer, given the fact that the summer is peak driving season? You know, last summer, there was um, everything was going wrong. We had supply chain bottlenecks. We have uh, the war on Ukraine and uh, gasoline and food prices rising. Now we're in a slightly better situation. Um, so, um, so supply chain bottlenecks have eased and we have seen food prices coming off from the highs. So that's why I was saying that there is some, uh, I mean, at least a bigger wiggle room for the Fed to kind of adopt a wait and see attitude. And on top of that, GDP right now is uh, the momentum is flagging. Last summer, it was actually going up on an upswing. So I think that all this is giving the Fed more hesitancy in, um, you know, reacting instantaneously to higher oil prices. And your view uh, still is 25 basis points and then done. Uh, the yes. The year. Yes. No cuts, though. No cuts. Got it. Anna, Anna thank, thank, you. thank you so Big much thanks for your to Anna insight. Wong. Anna Wong, that's right, our Bloomberg economist, chief U.S. economist. Coming up, Trump has landed in New York City, and the hype continues to grow around tomorrow's arraignment. A deeper dive into the legal hurdles next. This is Bloomberg. He's gearing up for a, a battle. Um, you know, this is something that obviously we believe is a political persecution, and I think people on both sides of the aisle believe that, that it's a complete abuse of power. We're way too early to start deciding what motions we're going to file or not file, um, and, and we do need to see the indictment and get to work. I mean, look, Tuesday's just the beginning. Former President Donald Trump's attorney there, Joe Tacopina, and here to speak with us more about all of that is going on with this indictment and tomorrow's arraignment. Rebecca Royfe, distinguished professor of law at New York Law School and former assistant district attorney for New York County. Rebecca, thank you so much and welcome. I'm actually in New York at the moment, and it is gridlock in Midtown Manhattan. There's a ton of journalists, and there's also some Trump supporters, what some are calling a circus. But tomorrow is the start of a very long journey. Can you take us through how long this could potentially take, this saga the former president has with the Manhattan DA? Well, you know, it really can take a long time, and that long time really is due process doing its work. So once he's arraigned, there's a process by which he'll obtain evidence through discovery. There will be motions that are filed. Um, legal issues will be argued, and you know things proceed, but they proceed, you know, in 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 a certain slow pace. So it will take a lo long time before we get to a trial if we get there at all. There's been talk, Rebecca, I wonder what you, th you think about it, of uh, a potential gag order that could be facing the former president if he continues to make statements encouraging people to protest, uh, suggesting that the judge hates him and so forth. Is that something that would come easily for a former president? 
So I really think the judge is going to try his best to avoid having to impose a gag order and will use all sorts of efforts at persuasion. But if those fail, then I am absolutely sure that the judge will do so because at a certain point when litigants are speaking in a way that he has been speaking in the past, it's not just mm. banter in the political realm. It's conversation, statements that can truly affect the outcome of a case. And that is the kind of thing where it's appropriate for a judge to step in and say enough at a certain point. So we'll see. It will depend on how persistent the former president is in continuing to make these sorts of statements and how much he resists the gentle urging of the judge, which will certainly come if he does. Hmm. Rebecca, if there is this gag order, he's supposed to give this speech Tomorrow evening, after he has this arraignment in New York City, he's going back to Mar-a-Lago. Could he give that speech under a gag order? Well, no, I certainly don't think the gag order will come that quickly. And I also don't think the gag order will cover all sorts of statements that he can make or would make about the case. It's just, you know, he can make broad sweeping statements. It's a question of whether, you know, when he starts to make certain, either, either certain kinds of threats that he has made in the past or statements that really could affect the way potential jurors see the evidence. And so it, it will be a while before, if there is a gag order, it will take some time before the judge imposes it. The judge would certainly not impose something like that at arraignment. And also, you know, given the sensitivity of a campaign, I think the judge will be extremely reluctant to impose that kind of order and will instead try to make a very tailored plea with the with the litigants to to be careful about what they say. I'll just take it upon myself at this moment, Rebecca, to remind everyone that we still do not know what the charges are inside this indictment. When will we? First of all, sorry about the barking dog. <laughs> um, I, I, we will find out after the arraignment tomorrow. So when in New York, when somebody is indicted before they are actually arrested, that indictment is sealed until mm -hmm. the case um, until the case is arraigned. And then the indictment becomes public. And that is so that the person who is accused of a crime is the first person to see the charges against them. And I also want to ask you, Rebecca, about Trump adding another lawyer to his team. Is he starting to lawyer up? Does he not have faith in his current team? You know, I, I don't think it's so unusual. You have um, lawyers who, ha who um, have a certain expertise, and then sometimes as the case proceeds, you bring in other lawyers with different kinds of expertise. And so far, his case, his lawyers are very, very familiar with the New York criminal justice system. They're experienced trial attorneys. He may be looking for somebody who has a little bit more, I'm sorry about the din in my background, who has a little bit more experience with white collar cases or some kind of expertise in the subject matter. And so he may be doing that. It's not, it's fairly common for legal teams to expand at a point like this. There's also uh, reporting that Donald Trump's team will seek a change in venue, Rebecca, that Staten Island they see as a more friendly environment. What are the chances that happens? So the chances are pretty low. We saw this, if you remember, in recently in the uh, Harvey Weinstein case, where Harvey Weinstein also mm -hmm. thought he would have uh, a very prejudiced jury here in Manhattan and was seeking a jury somewhere elsewhere outside of the city. And he lost that motion. Uh, and very frequently, um, that's the way these things play out. But you never really know until um, until the point at which you get to the to, to the determine the legal determination. Well, Rebecca, what do you make of um, news media organizations asking for cameras to be loud into the Manhattan courtroom? They're saying this historic moment and the public should be able to witness it. Now, Trump's lawyers are urging the judges not to allow that. What decision do you think they'll make? My guess is they will abide by the wishes of the defendant and the defendant's lawyers, and they will not allow cameras into the courtroom. I certainly understand the argument that this is momentous and there's a huge amount of public interest. The trial will remain public in terms of the way in which the information will become public, but to have cameras is a totally different level. And if the defense team does not want that, I can't imagine the court deciding over their objection to allow the cameras in. Well, so what will we see and not see, Rebecca? Is this going to be a couple of black SUVs going into a parking lot, or will they give him venue to come outside and speak after, do you think? 
Uh, my guess is it's it, we, we, that the public won't see a whole lot tomorrow. That they have made arrangements, and again, it's it's a guess, but that they have made arrangements yeah. to um, have him come into the court in a way that um, is fairly low key, and that would be to ensure his safety throughout this process. Um, but you know, it may be that he goes through the front door. It's just a matter of how they have arranged it. And I know that there were discussions or there were reported discussions between the New York police and the Secret Service. Having the Secret Service involved is certainly different from um, recent cases, even very high profile ones. And that makes it such that they make, may make unique arrangements in a case like this. Rebecca, what does tomorrow's arraignment mean in the sense that Trump is still facing three other big-time investigations, whether it's not on the federal level or Georgia's district attorney? How difficult is the next year going to be? Do you, do you believe we will see those cases come to fruition in the next year? Again, I think it's really impossible to read the tea leaves, but I think it is important to think of this as one piece of a larger legal battle that is facing the former president. And while these charges may all be unrelated or loosely related, overlapping or not overlapping at all, um, they are all battles that he will have to face. And he can use rhetoric um, in his political campaigns that make it seem as if they are all one, you know, democratic, sort of motive, politically motivated hit job. But when it comes down to the courtrooms, he's going to have to address the real legal jeopardy or exposure that he has. And those are going to be different in different courtrooms at different times with different challenges. Rebecca, thanks for being with us today. The arraignment, of course, tomorrow at 2.15 p.m. Rebecca Royfe with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, former President Trump is now in New York ahead of tomorrow's court appearance. We'll talk it out next with our political panel. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Now, keeping up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm John Hyland. That Chinese spy balloon that floated over the U.S. in February reportedly gathered intelligence from several military sites. According to NBC News, that intelligence was collected from mostly electronic signals rather than images. The U.S. shot down the balloon off the coast of South Carolina. The debris that was recovered is still being analyzed. UBS reportedly will cut its uh, workforce by 30 percent after completing that takeover of Credit Suisse. That's according to a Swiss newspaper. The paper said even as many as 11,000 employees will be laid off in Switzerland and another 25,000 worldwide. Meanwhile, Swiss prosecutors are gathering evidence as part of a possible criminal investigation into the deal. The Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis President Jim Bullard told Bloomberg TV it's unclear what higher oil prices will mean for U.S. monetary policy. Bullard said, quote, this was a surprise. Whether it will have a lasting impact is an open question. Bullard does not vote on monetary policy this year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Hyland. This is Bloomberg. Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV with a live view of Trump Tower in Manhattan. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington, joined by Anne-Marie Hordern in New York. Anne-Marie, you had a chance to walk by Trump Tower. Still more reporters than protesters from what we understand. But by this time tomorrow, we're actually going to know what the charges are in this case. And either way, that's going to change the conversation. Yeah, that's a great point, Joe. At this moment, it's still sealed this indictment. We do not know exactly what the former president is being charged. We obviously have some ideas, but tomorrow we'll have a lot more details on what exactly the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg is bringing these charges against the former president. And to your point, as we look at this Trump Tower photo in Midtown Manhattan, Joe, lots more reporters than supporters. It was an entire city block of just lenses and producers, journalists with their reporter pads, and I think everyone got maybe a five, ten-second glimpse of the former president as he entered Trump Tower. That's right. He is there now. We should let our viewers know if you're just joining us. Donald Trump will spend the night at Trump Tower tomorrow. Uh, he will wake up, do whatever he's got to do, and head for the courthouse, 2.15 p.m., 
will be the arraignment. And then he heads back to Mar-a-Lago. And this is interesting uh, stagecraft here. Uh, love him or hate him, Anne-Marie, he's going to make a, a prime time address from Mar-a-Lago tomorrow. And I'll be deeply curious to see how many TV networks carry this. Obviously, massive free media for a former president who's running for re-election. Yeah, certainly. He'll be jetting right back to Mar-a-Lago for that speech. And we have to just continuously remind ourselves, Joe, this is not just a former mm -hmm. president, right? He is a presidential candidate for 2024. And so far, what we've learned from his right. campaign is that they are raking in a ton of money, north of $7 million, since the news of his indictment first landed. So far, this has been a profitable experience for Donald Trump. We don't know how long that'll be the case. And joining us for more on that is our political panel, Bloomberg Politics contributors Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. We left off on this very story on Friday with our panel. Rick and Jeannie are closers. Now they're opening the week with us here. And Rick, I wonder what your thoughts are as Donald Trump makes his triumphant return here uh, to New York. This could feel very different tomorrow once we learn what the charges are, how important will it be for this case to appear to go beyond, for instance, the testimony of Michael Cohen? Joe, I think we'll be talking about this many more Fridays to come. This is going to be a <laughs> long haul. Uh, and I'm not sure I'd refer to it as a triumphal return. He's back here to get indicted. Uh, and so I, I'm, I think no matter how much everyone thinks this is good for him uh, from a political consequence, uh, it's really bad for the country to have a former president uh, in the situation that I got to remind everybody, he made for himself. Uh, so, uh, look, I think that this is very consequential. Uh, in, in, and I think, as Anne Marie said, not only is he a presidential candidate, but he's the front runner in the Republican primary right now. And so, this is a very important moment in history, uh, both for the country and for the party right now. And the real question is how will the rest of the party react to tomorrow? I know what Donald Trump's going to say I'm innocent. But will the rest of the party start talking about moving beyond him so that he doesn't wreck the party on the shoals of this indictment? Jeannie, when you look at the polls, though, there's a new ABC Ipsos poll that shows that a plurality of Americans think that he should have been charged, but then the same amount also think it's politically motivated. Is this going to be difficult for the Democrats? You know, I, I don't think it's going to be as difficult for the Democrats. I think what Joe Biden and what the Biden team would like more than anything is a rematch of 2020 because they feel like if Donald Trump is, as Rick said, the leading candidate and he remains that way, and I think that's a big if, but if that happens, they feel like they have a better shot running against him given all the, th the obstacles that Joe Biden, quite frankly, is facing than if it's another candidate. But that said, I don't think we know, and I thought one of the most stunning aspects of that poll was even before we know what the charges are and we don't know, you still had about one in five Republicans saying he should be indicted mm -hmm. and six out of 10 independents. If we look at what that indictment comes out to be tomorrow and what the charges are, those numbers may grow and that may change the trajectory of all this support and all this money that he's gotten in the last few days. In the meantime, Rick, it's showbiz time for Donald Trump. This is classic Trump. Show up a little early, make this into a two-day story. What does he say in this primetime address tomorrow from Mar-a-Lago? No, I think he has to set the record straight about his innocence. Uh, that's going to be probably job number one. Talk about his uh, persecutors. Uh, you know, he's the grievance candidate, right? So he's going to have a lot mm -hmm. of fun with throwing the judge under the bus and the prosecutor and... I'm sure he'll claim he's not going to get a fair shake in Manhattan because they don't love him as much as other people do. Um, and so I think he'll set up the narrative for what he'll then go out and campaign on, which is the system is rigged against the people. He's the man of the people. And without him being in the White House, uh, everyone's going to be under the thumb of the Justice Department, the FBI, the prosecutors. Uh, he's just, a, you know, he's just the, the symbol of what's wrong with the system. And I'm sure that's probably going to be where he heads tomorrow night. You just said he's the symbol of what's wrong with the system, Rick. What do you think of the former governor of Arkansas coming in, Governor Hutchinson? Yeah, it's sort of the good news, bad news of the week in presidential politics. I mean, he's like a nice guy, uh, terrific resume. He's done everything. He did support the former right? president, though. Uh, he, he, well, to some degree. He, he pushed back on the prosecution. I think people are making a very big mistake by saying, a, a liberal Democrat prosecutor in Manhattan going after a former president, going after him, I think is fair game. 
but they're not saying he's that Donald Trump is innocent or that somehow you know he should uh, he didn't do what they're claiming he did. So I, I think there's a difference. But I think Asa Hutchinson is going to have his work cut out to try and be his own guy, to actually break through this really difficult Trump narrative that's weaving its way through the policy now. And to that point, Rick, he didn't actually even announce. He said, teed up, I will have a big announcement coming up in April. And also coming up in this show, how is the race for president in 2024 affected by the upcoming charges against former President Trump? More on that with our political panel, Rick and Jeannie, after the break. This is Balance of Power. have made a decision, and my decision is I'm going to run for President of the United States. While the formal announcement will be later in April in Bentonville, uh, I wanted to make clear that to you, Jonathan, I am going to be running. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. That was former governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson, saying he plans to announce a 2024 presidential run. Continuing our discussion on the 2024 race, our political contributors, Rick Davis and Jeannie Shan Zeno. Rick, we got your thoughts on what you think of Governor Hutchinson. Do you think, but he's only pulling out like 1% right now. Jeannie, do you think this is the kind of individual that could potentially concern the Democrats? Because as you say right now, they want the nominee to be the former President Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, I think if he was able to raise in the polls and to raise a whole lot of money, um, but I don't think this is exactly the kind of person that the Democrats or Joe Biden in particular is going to be scared of at this point point. You know, of course, they would prefer somebody who is far right MAGA because that allowed them to make this case. So Joe Biden could say, look at the crazy over there. And even if you don't love me, choose me to these independents and moderates. So, you know, at this point, I don't think Asa Hutchinson is as much of a concern. But again, it's so early. And you look at some of the state polls and you see people like Asa Hutchinson, he may have some you know, he may have some pull in a place like Iowa, close to his home. DeSantis, who had a really tough last few weeks, mm. his poll numbers are better in the states of New Hampshire and Iowa than they are nationally. So there's a long way to go here. We are just in the early stages, but nobody is close to Trump at this point. And if you ask the Biden administration in the campaign, that's the way they want it. I spoke with Asa Hutchinson on Bloomberg Sound On. Rick and Jeannie, you were both there on Bloomberg Radio in February. This was just after the State of the Union address, and I asked him what it takes to beat Donald Trump, knowing that he was likely to announce. Here's what he said. Well, I think he sort of beats himself. You know, you look at uh, what happened on January 6th and what, how he's conducted himself uh, even since uh, he lost the election. And it's not bringing out the best of America, not bringing out the best of our democracy. It's appealing to our worst instincts. Mm. And so uh, I see uh, his support diminishing over time. Diminishing over time. Rick Davis, of course, we've seen his numbers increase. The latest from Trafalgar over the weekend has Trump at 56, Ron DeSantis at 23. Is Asa Hutchison too late? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think there's a little bit of rallying around the flag within the Republican Party right now. Donald Trump's under attack. New York prosecutor, it's the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And, and so I think mm -hmm. a lot of Republicans are defending Donald Trump and it's boosting his numbers. I think Asa could be prophetic in his statement that the January 6th investigation could wind up actually becoming a problem for Donald Trump and whittling away his support because it's one thing to complain about porn star payments. It's another thing uh, to <laughs> have been participating in sedition uh, and trying to overturn a legal election. And so Asa may have a point to be made. We'll see. He's got to run his own campaign. He'll be focused on building his name ID and, and making a, a, a pitch to, to voters. And, and I think that's what he's going to be focused on in the near term. Many thanks to our panel. Bloomberg political contributors Rick Davis, partner at Stonecourt Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano with us, political science professor at Iona University. Great conversation. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. Coming up tomorrow, we'll have analysis and reaction from right here, what's going on in New York, the criminal charges, Joe, brought against the former President Trump by Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg. It's going to be That's right. Anne-Marie's staying in New York.
You let us know how it's going up there. At this time tomorrow, we're going to know a lot more, Anne-Marie. We'll see you then. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.